Over the past three years, as we in the learning and development profession have battled with almost unparalleled levels of uncertainty and pressure on resources, at Onlinement we have found ourselves engaged more and more often in discussions with learning providers, both external and in-house, looking to reinvent their offerings for their particular markets. Of course, this isn't the first time that learning providers have had to struggle with tight market conditions. But this may well be the first time that customers, internal and external, are beginning to question the very basis of the service offering. So what's changed? In this presentation, I'm going to start by reviewing the most common problems that learning and development departments are facing. I'll then describe a generic vision to which learning and development departments could aspire for the future. I'll follow that by exploring six different strategies that L&D departments might like to use to achieve that vision. And I'll finish by talking through some of the steps that any department's going to have to take as they start their journey of exploration. So let's start off by trying to determine just what the problem is. The first problem, which seems to be occurring just about everywhere, is that budgets for training are flat or reducing. The second problem is that with everybody having to work much harder than perhaps they used to in the past, time is so short that managers are finding it harder to release their staff for days at a time to attend training programs. Not only this, but uh, travel budgets are under pressure, making it harder and harder for participants to travel to central locations to receive training. And L&D staff in many cases are quite apprehensive about the idea of using new learning technologies and that's holding them back. Another problem is that uh, many L&D departments have had a poor experience in the past of using rather tedious self-study e-learning. But in spite of all these pressures, I think it's generally true that L&D people are reluctant to compromise on the quality of the solutions that they offer. And in other cases, you know you really do have to make changes, but you're not sure where to start. OK, so we've seen what the problems are. But let's take a moment now to look into the future to develop a vision for what L&D could look like. Now, obviously, every individual organisation is different from every other. But I hope you'll be able to identify with at least some of the aspects of the vision that I'm going to present to you now. We've long been told that L&D activities need to be aligned to the needs of the business. That doesn't mean that it goes without saying. All too often L&D interventions are fulfilling requirements articulated sometime in the distant past, but which have no current relevance. In other cases, interventions were originated by the L&D department on the basis of where they believe the organisation should be heading, regardless of the views of senior management. It's obvious in today's rather testing times that L&D needs to be economical. But in fact, there's always been this need. It's incumbent on any manager, regardless of function, to utilise as few of the organisation's resources as possible in fulfilling their responsibilities. And L&D is no different. It makes no difference whether you regard training as a cost or an investment. If it's a cost, then the organization's profits will be maximized by keeping this to a minimum. On the other hand, if it's an investment, then you're obligated to keep this as small as it can be without unduly threatening the returns. Learning interventions are scalable when they're capable of delivering high-quality results to ever larger audiences. There's little doubt that when used for the right purpose and well executed, one-to-one -one learning can be extremely effective, but it's hardly scalable. After all, there's only so many hours in a day that any instructor, coach or mentor can dedicate to the task. While there's often a need to include an element of one-to-one -one or small group learning in a blend, because that's the only way of making sure the job gets done right, there are many more occasions on which far more scalable methods can be applied. There are some pretty amazing recent examples, including the free online courses run by Stanford University, which have attracted hundreds of thousands of students. There's also the Khan Academy, which offers free online maths lessons. Last time I looked, in March of 2012, 130 million people had taken advantage. 
Flexibility is an important element in the vision for a transformed L&D. What it implies is more control for L&D's customers, the employees of an organisation. Adults expect to have control over what they learn, when and where, and will increasingly demand it. They expect it because they've grown accustomed to finding whatever information they need at the click of a mouse from Google, YouTube and Wikipedia. Learning interventions need to be engaging, because without learner engagement there's very little chance that any meaningful learning will take place. Engaging interventions attract and maintain interest. They arouse the emotions. They're full of energy, just like learning should be. Clearly, learning interventions are of little or no value to an organisation if they don't generate lasting results. That means changes in behaviour which are clearly aligned to where the business wants to be in the future. Changes that have a measurable impact on business metrics. OK, so we know now where we want to be, but what strategies do we have to put in place if we can have any chance of achieving this vision? There's clearly no one answer that will work for every organisation, but I'm going to suggest six shifts that I believe will make a big difference. This slide looks a little like an audio mixer. As you can see along the top, it includes six meters which show how we're progressing in achieving our vision. If the needle moves to the left, that's a negative. If it moves to the right, we're getting somewhere. The six sliders represent our strategies. Let's check out the first one. Much of the training we deliver is generic. It's the same for everyone. Now it's clearly more economical to provide the same training to large populations. But that's at a cost in terms of relevance and usefulness. Let's try shifting the slider along a little from generic to tailored. Now there are many ways to tailor interventions to meet individual needs. Perhaps the best way is to increase modularity, so learners only access the material that's relevant to their needs. And a more blended approach allows for individual support to be provided only at those points in a program where it's most needed, and to those individuals who need the most help. So what are the effects? Well, we're looking at learning that's better aligned, more engaging, and more powerful. On the other hand, we lose a little bit in terms of how economical we can be and perhaps how scalable. But I think this is a price that we can afford to pay. The next possibility is to shift from synchronous to asynchronous delivery. In other words, from real-time to self-paced. Learning in real-time allows for an easy flow of communication that gets the job done quickly. On the other hand, it requires all participants to be available at the same time. Let's try pushing the slider more towards asynchronous delivery. Self-paced approaches based on online content and asynchronous forms of collaboration, such as forums, wikis and blogs, provide the learner with much more flexibility in terms of when they learn. They also allow time for reflection. So what are the effects in terms of our vision? Well, we've got learning that's more scalable and more flexible with the possibility perhaps that asynchronous learning is not quite as engaging as the synchronous equivalent. The third option we have is to shift the emphasis away from compliance training and towards competency building. Most organizations have a regulatory or policy requirement to provide certain training. That's fine, but when compliance is all that's required, you end up with a demotivating tick box exercise. Let's push the slider. By shifting the emphasis from mere compliance to one of achieving competence, you do away with the sheep dip approach that everyone hates. In its place, you focus on really engaging the learner with the topic and then providing them with the confidence they need to put the learning to use. So what's the result? Well, we gain in terms of learning that's better aligned, more engaging and more powerful, but at the expense to some degree in terms of economy and scalability. Our fourth strategic option is to increase the support we provide for bottom-up learning. The management of any organisation has a responsibility to make sure its employees can perform and will put in place all sorts of programmes on a top-down basis. But there will never be enough time or money to meet all needs in this way. Let's push the slider. By engaging employees as teachers as well as learners, sharing their expertise in support of their peers, you'll fill in all those gaps left by the top-down approaches. The result is learning that's far more economical and far more scalable. 
So, on to the fifth option, a shift away from courses to resources. The best courses inspire learners and provide them with the confidence they need to apply new skills. But often we take courses too far. We overteach and overwhelm. Again, let's push the slider. Employees no longer really expect to have to learn every fact, process or procedure. Once they have a grounding in terms of key concepts, principles and skills, they look to just-in-time resources, both people and content, to help them get the job done on a day-to-day -day basis. And that has major effects practically right across the board. We get learning that's more economical, more scalable, more flexible, more engaging and more powerful. As you can see from the meters, we're close to achieving our vision. So let's try and close the gap by shifting emphasis from face-to-face -to, -face to online delivery. Face-to-face -face learning can be very special indeed, whether that's on the job or in a classroom. Sometimes you need that rich, multi-sensory environment to achieve what you want. But being face-to-face -face comes at a big price in terms of flexibility and cost. We can afford to shift the emphasis. We consume most music, drama and sport electronically in the home or when we're on the move. Going to a concert hall, theatre or stadium is a memorable event, but we don't need to do it every day. It's the same with learning. Most of the time we can get the job done satisfactorily online, whether self-paced or in a virtual classroom. If we're selective about what we do face-to-face -face and what we do online, the end result is entirely positive. We can get learning that's more economical, more scalable and more flexible. So how do you make all this happen? What path should you follow if you are to put all these new strategies in place? Let's start by acknowledging that every situation is different. First of all, you need to be absolutely clear about your requirements. What is it you're looking to achieve through your learning and development efforts? What difference are you trying to make? Secondly, what are the defining characteristics of the population you're looking to address? How can they be described in terms of their prior knowledge, their motivation to learn, their expectations and their independence as learners? And thirdly, what constraints are you working under in terms of budget, time, technology, facilities, and the size and the geographic distribution of your target population. These unique characteristics help to shape a transformation plan that's custom built to reflect your particular needs. At the heart of your transformation plan is a redefined learning architecture, one that supports learning in all of its contexts, formal, non-formal, on-demand and experiential. Beyond this, you'll need to create an appropriate infrastructure with all the necessary policies, platforms and tools. To address each new requirement as it occurs, you'll need the skills to diagnose the causes of performance problems and design solutions that bring together the right mix of media and methods and to design, develop and deliver your next generation blended solutions. You'll need a host of new skills, not least in the design of engaging digital learning content, the delivery of great live online sessions and the facilitation of collaborative, connective learning. Transformation is never going to be easy, but with a clear vision, innovative strategies and a little help from your friends, you're well on the way.